Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Really appreciate it. Um, it's been a pretty wild couple of days, hasn't it? More we wise than one. <laughs> <laughs> We've had the book launch uh, last night, which went really well. And, and tonight, it's going to be kind of similar, but a little bit more of a, an intimate discussion with uh, these two prominent elders. So I know you both are pretty flat out all the time, so it's great that you uh, were both able to come and join us. Um, so tonight's event is the first astronomer is a conversation with Uncle Gil and Michael Anderson and now we each Caroline Briggs. So fortunately, now we Caroline was able to join us today. weren't entirely sure, so we get to have a nice conversation with the three of us today. So I want to begin by acknowledging that we're all sitting on the unceded lands of the Kulin Nation, of the Winnerong and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I want to pay those respects to elders past and present and extend that on to any Aboriginal Torres Strait or First Nations people who are here today. Um, it's really exciting to be here to talk about all the work that's happening in the area of star knowledge. A little bit about the book, but more about platforming the elders so we can learn about this directly from the source. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to, I haven't planned anything. I've got no set questions. I want it to be kind of an organic conversation. Where we sit and just have a chat, talk for a while. If there's audience questions, raise your hand. You know, I want it to be not terribly formal. I'm in this room lecturing on indigenous astronomy every day. And it can get very sterile and stale. And of course, we don't like that. So we're just going to sit here, have a nice conversation, and then after that, um, we'll be sitting at the table at the end. If you brought a book, um, happy to sign it for you. We don't have any for sale. We sold all of them yesterday in like five minutes, I think, that we had. So um, yeah, without further ado, I want to introduce the two wonderful elders we have sitting here before us. We have Uncle Gillar Michael Anderson. Uncle Gillar is a senior lawman, an elder, and the leader of the Uwali Nation in Gaduga, New South Wales. That's up almost to the Queensland border. Um, and the Uwali Nation extends across from the Queensland and New South Wales. Um, Uncle Gillar is one of the co-founders and the sole surviving member of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy that was set up in 1972. And you have, well, both of you have quite illustrious CVs. I'm not going <laughs> to go through the whole things. Um, but it's been fantastic because you worked with uh, Dr. Bob Fuller a few years ago. Uh, and the two of you published a whole number of research papers on indigenous astronomy. And of course, Uncle Gillar is one of the uh, co-authoring elders on the first astronomers. Now we, Caroline Briggs, local, um, is uh, now we, Caroline Briggs AM, the senior Bunurong elder and founder and chair of the Bunurong Foundation. Uh, you were recognized as the uh, National Aboriginal Elder of the Year in 2011 by the National NADOC Committee. And you recently, yeah, I'm reading off that thing. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote it down, but I want to make sure I get it right. And you just finished a PhD, so you're not being Dr. Caroline Briggs. No, I'm a professor now. Prof oh, sorry. <laughs> now we professor Dr. Caroline Briggs. Oh, well, I finished last, what, seven? Yeah, when I was seven. That's right. You got a PhD. Um, working with uh, indigenous <laughs> urban youth on connecting with traditional knowledge. So I'm really excited to have both of you here today. And I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, well, I didn't plan anything. How are we going to do this? So I'm going to close the door. Some wanderers come in. I've got a few slides as talking points if we need it. But one thing I've realized with us is we never have a problem chatting about stuff. We've got one mic. So here we go. <laughs> here you go. Okay. So one of the exciting things about um, yesterday is, you know, we had a few minutes to talk a little bit about the stars. And I think what would be nice today, as opposed to yesterday, is let's talk about the book and more talk about the knowledge and, and what you want to see for the future and what you'd like to talk to everybody about. So I know yesterday you were talking a bit about the moon. And there were some discussions about that, right? Yes, because um, the moon is a part of well, our ecology in, in relation to our story, so it's the 13 moons. And they, these were on a regular, before colonisation was a, a regular practice, where the women got together and celebrated the moon. Um, because of different cycles in our life ways, I think that's very important. I come from, I'm Bonwarang, or Yalakawilam, but I'm also 
Wimba Wemba, Barat Barat, and I'm also a descendant of the Turaway people. Briggs is married to Matiena in um, off the islands in uh, northwest Tasmania. So I have pretty amazing pedigree, <laughs> whatever, but um, I'm survived because of the sealing and whaling industry and then gold when she came, was able to come back to her country and ended up at Corinder and up to Maloga and then Kamragunja. So this has been a mapping process, but it's about how you're brought up and you, you think you're brought up in, in a structure that is very much an organised structure that we don't realise that about space, about connection to our environment, and it was it was seen as normal in that period of time. But I also lived under two acts, and the two acts, the last act was to forget, erase our memories of our existence. So. This has been a journey, so when you grew up a bit free on my grandmother's country, up in a place called Mooloman, which is not far from um, uh, where uh, a lot of our people were on uh, Munakala, which is a mission just outside of Deniliquin, but very close to Mooloman, which is about 45 k's from Swan Hill, if we're going to measure it from the old <laughs> measurements. Um, but your playground was your environment, your family. But it was always reading stars, reading. Well, that was your storybook of a life. And someone was asking me the other day, what do you see as open space to these construct, confined space? Because you, you had boundaries, you had normality, you had something that was familiar where these sort of constructs are very controlling, organised, and it's open for questioning, where our culture was about not questioning. What you were told, what you were informed, is about life ways. So you, you accepted that knowledge, I, I believe. You accepted it as the norm, but you were to forget it. They're the realities, and um, but now we're on to regenerate that knowledge and open it up and share that part of the process, but bring our young people along with the stories. And that's what my PhD was about. How do we regenerate or defining an elder? What's the roles and responsibility as an elder? It's not because you get old. It's an earned. It's about being recognised and being um, inherited. It's about the inheritance and then accepting the role, which is not an easy role, because you're on constant call. Had a lot of calls today. So um, this technology is amazing, but so is the other technology. And what you've been able to achieve with all these amazing people of my part, part of my, part of my, well, recognition of the amazing movement that you guys, and then thinking about Cherokee's family, who led that Bunurong claim way back, and then me having to establish a Southeastern Lands Council. So, you know, all mm. these activism was led out of, prior to the, all these, generations that we've been always projecting what was occurring in our, our life. And I think if we start to reflect on those things, to give some sort of framework that what you did was put it into a document, evidence of what you get gleaned from a lot of First Nations peoples, what gave up because they obviously respected you because you had a skill of listening, and listening <coughs> and sharing. That, uh, and also, they're sharing their mastery of their knowledge that sufficed for even 80,000 plus human years, 80,000. 
that's a time. I don't know how you measure it, but only space can measure that. <laughs> but I think I'm going to hand it over to you, Uncle, because we've been a part of a generation that leaders came before us. <laughs> so it's about leaders that came before us and followed, and we continue to follow on. Thank you. Yeah. We're having fun. We are. <laughs> I'm, I'm just laughing at this phone. <laughs> modern technology. We don't, modern, we don't, we don't have a proper modern, microphone. Modern technology. technology. No, that's fine. Um, thank you. And thank you. Um, I, I just want to open up by um, saying that as a child growing up, I never realised um, what the old one was doing with us as young kids. And um, I was lucky because I grew up with a grandmother with a lot of knowledge and um, a grandfather who, um, who was fully initiated and, um, <clears throat> and town was very strange to me because I lived out on the properties and out on the country and um, saw my mother when I was five year old because my granny took me off her. Um, so so in, in, in those five years that um, I was blessed with the fact that um, I, I, by the time I was seven year old, I knew everything about the grasses, the trees, the plants, what I could eat, what little, funny little things that crawl around on things that you can grab and eat them raw, and like widgety grubs, you pull a little stick in there and you can pull them out and keep walking. You don't need water on country when you know what saps to get out of the trees. And so you get those saps from the trees and you can just toddle around everywhere and you don't need to carry a bottle of water like what we people do these days in the cities. You know, we just know where the trees are and we mark the trees as we get around. So I learnt about, um, as, a, as an infant, as a child, um, how to survive on country. And that was, that was really something else. And as I grew up, <clears throat> um, I began to understand the influences of, um, of nature and Mother Nature and how Mother Nature sort of, um, works in terms of providing sustenance. And a lot of this was around um, all the native foods and we were sort of getting into all those areas where the, where the nature was providing all the native foods. And so on those properties, you know, the only thing that was valuable to us was um, a sheep every now and then. Um, but other than that, we were eating, eating plants and gums and uh, raiding the poor old native bee, bees in the trees and getting the honey. So we had a, a, a really good life. And um, I, I've often said to my own children, um, when we talk about poverty, uh, and I say to them, you know, I grew up, um, we, we had nothing, um, but we weren't poor. Poverty wasn't in the, in the vocabulary. And so when people say, you know, we were destitute and poor, um, yeah, we were destitute and poor because we didn't have the land. It wasn't ours anymore. They took it off us. But the land continued to provide for us. And, and so when we learned all those things and um, running around with no shoes and, you know, with the backside out of your pants and etc was totally irrelevant. It meant nothing to us, you know. Um, you didn't need swimming clothes. You would strip off and dive in the river when you needed to. And, you know, it wasn't until some Christian missionary told us that that was rude, you know, when we had to go to Sunday school and sit under a tree. And so we never really understood that lifestyle. So we grew up pretty much sort of segregated from all of that. Now, in amongst all of that, um, I think the most uh, the greatest impact I ever had about a space was 1958. Um, laying in a, out on, a, on an old bed with my grandma and my pop and my auntie and uncles. And my nan was sitting down listening to the ABC radio out in the bush. And, um, and they kept saying, look up at a certain hour and you'll see this thing flying across the sky. And it happened to be Sputnik. And so it went straight over the top of where we were on the country. And my brother was born that night. 
And my aunties, we, we name a child of a significant event at the time of birth. And my aunties and uncles gave him the name Sputnik. <laughs> <laughs> and only, that's the name he carries amongst the family. You know. and, and people always say, we well, you say Sputty all the time. What in the world is that when you're talking to him? And we said, no, that's his name. That's his Aboriginal name. Sputnik, an Aboriginal name. <laughs> Something went wrong there, somewhere. There. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you would then have to explain to people, no, there was a thing called Sputnik flying across the night he was born. And, um, and that's how he, how he got it. And so he understood this whole thing about skies. And then, but what I hadn't realised at that time was that I was, I was being taught all the time by the old ones, um, about when we used to lay down out in the bush, they'd see rings around the moon, or see a really bright sky. And then they, when, there was, when the sky was very clear at night time, um, they tend to go and put a jumper on, go and put a blanket over your shoulder. Otherwise, you're gonna get wet, because there's a, the, the uh, rain, the, the water that's still laying in the, in the, on the big warrenwall up there, the Milky Way, uh, that water that fell off there, where it tipped upside down, is still floating there. It hasn't come to earth yet. And so we get all this frost. Yeah? And so when you get the dew coming through, the old ones will see that clear sky, and, we'll, and that's when the water's coming down from the, from the sky, coming down through the atmosphere. And it lands in here. But that, that period is during the winter time. And so you then have all the frost on the ground. And we, like I say in the, in the um, Star Stories of Dreaming, you know, a lot of people didn't understand why uh, a lot of the Aboriginal men who were on droving camps, they keep all the stock locked up in the pens until about 11 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock in the morning. And uh, these old uh, drovers used to always say, why don't, why don't you let them out? And they said, well, if you let them out now, you can have dead animals. It's not good for you. And, and so those other fellows who wouldn't take notice, they ended up with cattle dying, they ended up with sheep dying, um, stock dying, simply because of the fact that we say that that new water coming down, that poison, because it hasn't been purified on the earth yet. It's new water coming from somewhere else. And, and that's what causes all the colic amongst all the animals. Um, during the winter time when they're eating that grass. And so we, we tell people not to do those things. So, and I, I learned these things from my grandfather and grandmother because um, they were basically looking after a lot of the stock and, and working on those stations. And so you, you begin to realise that there's a lot more to what's up there than what we understand here on Earth. And, um, you know, it's interesting that... Um, you know, that Thanks to, I guess, old Bob Fuller, who, you know, pestered me and pestered me, and, you know, he, I, I just had to give in, you know, he gave me the shit. He's good, though. <laughs> and, um, but, but he, he got to me, yeah, he did get to me. And then I, and, and, um, um, and then I had to talk to some of the old people as well to say, you know, look, this guy's asking questions, uh, even though I have authority uh, to talk about it, but it's always good to run it past your peers and say, well, you know, I'm prepared to talk with him about stuff and, you know, what, what do we talk, talk about? And they said, well, just sit and listen first and see what he's after and then work it out from there. And so here we are, Melbourne University, talking about stars and the universe. Um, but if I can just add <coughs> that, that what, what we see out there um, and the stories that we see and the stuff that's in the book, I said this last night, you know, he's got all the kids' stories in that book. They're kids' stories. There's much more behind those stories than we will talk about. Because that's only for the ones who are involved in acquiring the sacred spiritual knowledge. Because, you see, that's part of creation. And creation is not something that people have too much of an understanding about. 
And when you, when you do talk about creation, we begin to talk about um, some very sensitive things. And, um, and there's stuff that, you know, you don't tell, like, you, you don't tell a child. Um, massive stories about, you know, evolutionary process, you know. I think that the best example I ever saw was a television ad where the fellow with his kid asked his father, Mum, where did babies come from? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, I, I think that's a magnificent ad. You know. But when we talk about creation, we talk about it, you know, on a much broader set scale. Um, but to do more with, with, with the spiritual world, you know, and, and our existence, and how things work on this, on this uh, land. And so we, we watch what happens up there because that tells us everything. We come from there, you know. People ask us where we come from. And we, we do come from it. That, that's our place. That's where we come from. And we're going to go on there. We're going back there as well. You know? We're not hanging around down here all the time. We're just here on a mission. Part of the mission is to get educated. Yeah? But educated proper way. So that then you know the rules when you go to live there. Yeah? If you don't learn them here, they'll send you back again. And so we, you have to learn how those things, are, what's up there, lays down the rules for our behaviour and the way we live on this earth. And unfortunately, money wasn't invented at that time. And so we lost our way. And, um, and that's something that we need to address. And, and Aboriginal people are being forced uh, into, a, into an economy and be part of a, of a commercial world that really don't belong to us. Yeah. And that's why Australia got invaded, was because they couldn't feed all their people in England, you know, the, the men couldn't control their testosterone. And they just kept making babies all the time, without realising how the blame are we going to feed them all. Yeah? And look, at, look what's happening now. The exact thing, that, you know, that's it. And so the regulations of that is uh, controlled way up there. That tells us. And we, so we had to control our population. We, we control it. And the, we control it on the basis that, um, that the environment that we lived in could only provide sustenance for a certain number of people within a defined area. Yeah? And we had to understand that. And we had to work within the seasons. I, I loved um, a response um, from Marcy Langton some time ago, some crazy politician made a statement about the fact that, you know, um, the coming of the British people contributed to the advancement of the Aborigines <laughs> and helped us, you know, out of our poverty situation and, 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 and gave us um, new inventions. Otherwise, we'd be still running around throwing spears. Yeah. And, and of course, <clears throat> uh, and they said, look at Aborigines, they never even invented the wheel. Like, think about that for the moment, yeah? It'd be a rough trip with a kangaroo pulling a car. <laughs> <laughs> and it'd be an even worse trip with a bloody emu rain. <laughs> because they don't take notice to bridles. <laughs> and so, it's madness for some crazy white fellow to come up and say that. Oh, they didn't even get the wheel. For God's sake, I'm not gonna pull one. Yeah. So why in the world should we put the labour on us? You know, and it's like when I first met Jermaine Greer. Um, I had an old woman, granny of mine, she was about 91, not out, <clears throat> and come down from Brisbane because she was teaching me a lot of stuff. And um, she was at my place at Maroubra. And, and we all prayed, got, came back home with this Jermaine Greer. And the old woman's in the bedroom, I thought, you know, about midnight or something like that. We came back and we were all sitting in a circle, all the women and the guys. And um, she toddled out without any clothes on, this 90-year-old woman. Sorry, son, um, just getting a drink of water. So, you may not read his mouth dropped and everybody <laughs> else's chin was on the ground, you know. <laughs> and, um, and she walked past it again. Good night. <laughs> and everybody looked, nobody said anything, and then she came out with a pair of pants on. <laughs> yeah. 
And she said, what do you mum talking about? Oh, no, no, no. This wedding here, this white woman, yeah? She's talking about liberating all the women in the world. Oh, what that mean? Uh, burn the bra. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and then she's sitting there and she's, um, what else, what else you want? Oh, women want to be able to do the things men can do. Uh, what's stopping you now? And that just went down like a level. And then she started saying, and then Jermaine Greer made this ridiculous statement by saying, but look at you women, you know, your men dominate you. She said, who told you that? She said, you obviously don't live in a rebel again. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't know. Don't say things that you don't know. Yeah. And, so, and then she says, well, about knowledge, we need to get educated. She said, I don't think anybody stops you from going to school. Everybody goes to school. And so everything this woman was saying, the old woman kept knocking her down the time, saying, if you don't do it, well, then that's your problem. That's not everybody's problem. That's your problem. So if you've got an issue, then deal with it. And so we, and then she sat down, she started talking, and they started asking her questions about, um, about how we regulate things. And then her comment was very straight. We get it all from the south. We get it all from the south. So when you look at what we're writing in books or the stories that we're telling, there's a lot more behind um, those stories, a lot more. And, you know, we haven't even touched the surface on all those stories. And I think, you know, when we, the old people, they, they're always giving you some sort of, I will put it in a term of a metaphor, they say what's in the heavens or why who, why who. It's a reflection of, it's like this. And we haven't learned to see the in-between because we're probably impacted by light. Um, we're impacted by, we're in a hurry. So we don't take the time out to stop and breathe and rethink or about those concept of what's in the above is mm. below. So if we ever did that, I think I'll play that out with you at one stage. I wonder how we could do that. Um, look at across this continent and look at this constellation of our stars, but could we do it in a certain time? I don't know, because yeah. it keeps revolving. And I think they're the challenges, and when the old people talk that way, you, I remember taking young people out to a place called Mungo, they're all boys from a very prestigious school called Haleberry. So I was very fortunate. They wanted me to take them out to Mungo because I was running, working in the communities up there. And they taught me about... Someone's ringing up. I'm not sure. Someone's, I try to solve one problem, this creates another one. Mine is turned off. Yeah, well, I need to turn mine off, sorry. It's your phone. We'll use yours instead. <laughs> I've got the grandson just texting me too, so I've got one already in. Yeah. Oh, that doesn't work. Annoying. That doesn't work. This is 2022, right? Yeah, yeah just don't, just don't. You know. oh. Just hold it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> So I think about all, uh, yes, so these young, bo young boys all have ambitions and they're, they're conditioned that this is their life way, is to go out and, and follow the patterns of their, their prestigious families. And, and, their, and But then we were out in the middle of nowhere, no phones, no computers, no mm -hmm. technology. We're in the middle of Mungo. Mm -hmm. This was their biggest challenge. Because they're conditioned. That this is, this is our life way. We're going to be 
our life has been guided by being at this school and we're going to, our futures are going to be designated where we're heading in our, our life. So now that we're allowed to experience Indigenous knowledges by coming out <coughs> with me and with other elders of that, the Barkindji people. So you get a crash course with some old people in that region. So everybody has a different way of visioning this, their world through the constellation. So I thought, okay, I've learnt that. I've, I've pictured how this could be. I'll, I'll test it. <laughs> And I, I told this story last night where I took this young group of potential future leaders of the Western world. This is a long time ago, so about the 90s, I took these young, hopeful people experiencing Indigenous cultures on the land with diverse groups of First Peoples of that area and me. So I had to take them out in the middle of Mungo, laying, laying on a sand dune, getting the star alignments up and measuring how I could tell the stories of the hunters. And I, I'm, I'm mapping it and I'm remembering because you only get a crash course. You have to listen. You have to be observant. You're listening. You never question. And it's it's not the, it's not the, it's about the in-between, the shadows in-between. So you're working out the alignment of these hunters and you're mapping it through the skies with these young intellects, hopefuls for the future in our Western world. And they were, here they were being challenged from an Indigenous woman on somebody else's country, which was because they learnt, taught me and it was about the respect. So I thought, I'll play this out with these young hopefuls. Hopefully they will remember one day that someone guided them through the skies. And um, I did this mapping, told them the stories, but I was very particular how I would I don't want to make a mistake because I'm not setting them up. I'm not setting myself up to fail, but I'm not setting them up to fail. Because, you know, there are always someone who wants to challenge you. So I'm, I'm doing it in a monotone, as I was told. So I mapped it quietly, so we're walking through the stars. And... Um, I thought, gosh, it's getting dark. My mind flitted back to, it's getting dark. This place changes at night. It looks like the Great Wall of China when you drive up, but at night, it's a, it looks like a moonscape. It's pretty eerie because there's a lot of spirits in that place, a lot of energies. So I'm <coughs> getting a bit toey. <laughs> And I'm saying, OK, it's time we start to leave. And the teacher said to me, that was like a yoga mantra. Oh, OK, whatever you want to call it, that's fine. <laughs> well, it worked. And then the young boys, and they were all boys, and they said, we travelled with you, miss. I said, right, we're leaving now. So it sort of gave me an insight that People are looking for something and looking for a journey and learning from the oldest knowledges in the world of what our people, something that you, you don't question, but you go on that journey and you test yourself. And you test yourself in a way that's not the way measure, Western systems measure your abilities of intelligence, but it's about your understanding your worldview in life ways. And that was one of the biggest lessons I learned, that these young people had learned something from one of the oldest cultures in the world. And, and it was on someone else's culture. And it took me 
I was running these tours and it took me five years for them to trust that I wasn't going to pasteurise their storyboard, which was the stars, but it was also about me reaffirming my role in, the, in our, our world as a woman and remembering it's the old women that tell the stories to the children. And then when the children, or if they're male or female or whatever role they're moving through, they take that role on as they're learning. They're bringing it back. So when the young, young men go on their journey of, of life, their life ways and their responsibility of protecting the environment, they have to know the laws and they have to respect that their laws and knowledge came from their women. <coughs> because they're the first to induct them. And then the next stage is the male follows that pattern with his older lawmen. So it's, it's a reciprocal process. It's not something that is defined. You just know. And we're very lucky. Yes, we thought we were really poor, but we were probably more richer. It's taken a long time to get that sense of what is a wealth of knowledge, isn't it? But the mastery that you brought in that book, a mastery of many different nations that invested in telling you a story, that you invested in putting it into a language that hopefully these people will understand. They may never understand, but I work with little people and I tell them, and I tell them stories about language and they've written books, uh, they now illustrate the books, they're only kindy kids, they're only little minis, but they get it and they learn to hear the birds, they know what bird is, what bird's calling, they know the stories of the stars, they tell their parents, they become the teachers to their parents because they can read the language back because they've illustrated the stories, they know the language and then they, uh, they've produced a number of books that these young children illustrate. But it's about the intensity and when, the, when they didn't see me through COVID, I'd send the tapes down and the teachers would say, why why do you always lay down when auntie tells you a story? They said, auntie said, we've got a dream. So they, and I sort of went, oh, these are three and four year olds. So sometimes I think we've got to go back to being our child again and remember the essence of what being a child is and the wonderment of life. That's a, I think that's a little bit of the direction because it was our wonderment and our boundaries that can guided us to our life ways. And now we're here on a, in an academic setting. We've been challenged by our own knowledge base, but we're also challenging Western systems knowledge base. That's right. And bringing it as a collaboration. That we bring stories together. And I think about the navigation of my answers, my great grandmother coming back from a place called um, it was at that stage Gun Carriage Island, but I now know it's called Vansadard, and they've travelled between Preservation Island, so it's out in the Bass Strait. This was in the sealing industry. But she used to sing, and the moon and the stars would guide them back. They were <coughs> navigating back home. And whether it was hunting for seals or whales or that was the period of the economics that was impacting on our cultures. Mm. And my great-grandfather was from the grandson of Malagana, so they knew how to read the waterways. His, his white father was a shipbuilder in um, Derbyshire, in England, so I mapped him too. I went back and mapped him back to England to find out why this old man and we carry his name, Briggs, and I was trying to work out how they could describe him, what did he look like, what did he know and why did he sell my great-grandmother 
and left her in Mauritius. <laughs> so, but she came home. So I think about all that and think about, they're our stories. And they're our stories of <coughs> resilience, no, lifeway knowledges of celebrating the constellations. They didn't have books, but they had a, a, a wealth of knowledge that was probably more richer than what you could ever find in institutions. Thank you. If I could <coughs> just say, um, say this. Um, when, we, when we begin to look at those stars up there, um, in our society, one of the things about um, the, the white when they came here, um, and the ethnographers and, and, and the researchers started getting in amongst Aboriginal people, uh, the first thing that I noticed when I read was how they defined how Aboriginal people's um, life was organised. And it's interesting that they talk about the moiety, you know, this moiety. And moiety, just I understand, is to divide the world into two parts. Yeah. And so when you look at, at the division of the world in two parts, well, then we have that Milky Way up there. Yeah. And the Milky Way, when you look at the Milky Way, there's, if you look at the east side of the Milky Way, then you'll see that there's a brighter aura there that's, that's much brighter. On the western side, it, you've got the dark side. So we talk about the about the light side and the dark side of the Milky Way, and and within that within that um, area, then you have on one, on the light side, or the, on the eastern side of the Milky Way, all of those people there have a relationship to each other, all the tribes and all the, all the clans, and so and then you come onto the west side exactly the same thing again. So on the east side, those stars, on the bright side, we are not allowed. If you've got a totemic system that belongs to the east side, you cannot marry your children into any one of them. You must marry across the river. So you've got to go across the river, which is that Milky Way. And so the light side's got to go across to the dark side to find their wives. And so the old people understood who the people were. And, um, and so they understood that genealogical background of every family, every child. And so they made sure that, um, that, that when you made a promise to a child, you make sure that they're at least five generations removed from the people you want to marry them back into. Um, genetics was very important to us even though we didn't know it was genetics at the time, but it was maintaining the purity of the people so that we didn't, um, didn't do the wrong thing. And so all of this was very much dictated to by reading the stars up there and understanding how that works. And then across the middle there was this big wedge tail eagle he flew across the middle. And, um, and when that wedge tail flew across there, he split everything, then you had four quadrants. Um, and so you had the southern um, on the east side, the southern on the, on the, um, the west side, and then the north, etc. So we had the north and south. And so then these groups then married across into those. So the north east married into the north west, etc. But ironically, because it's a, it's a, we, I come from a matriarchal background and a matriarchal society. Um, so we have that emu laying up there, which we call Gawalu, which has no feathers, it's a, it's a featherless emu. But it's a sacred spirit that looks after the water. Um, and so when we talk about Gawalu coming to Earth, um, we talk about her coming at a certain time. And, and so when we look at that, at that up there, um, just when the, in August, about August, um, if you look to the north in the Milky Way, that's where you'll see the kangaroo starting to emerge. And you can see him at the bottom of the emu, yeah. under the bubatella, underneath her tail. And that's where that kangaroo will take his form. And, um, 
And so then we know that the kangaroos are breeding and it's a cycle of the starting of the breeding of the, of the kangaroos. And they, they start spreading, you, you get them right across the country. And a lot of our old men, I, I, I know Uncle Jack McCrae, you know, one of my teachers, mentors, um, who he was born about 1887. And um, he, he used to say, you know, we got it wrong, a small, why? And of the other, these are the conversations around the fire. We got it wrong. Why? Because look at us. The bloody poor emu, you know, that man. Yeah, you go fertilise the egg for the poor old woman, you know, have fun. But then when she has it, she runs away and he got to sit on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And not only does he have to sit on them, he has to wait until they all come out. Right? So he's got to squat there. And then when they come out, she's off finding another man and he's got to raise all them kids. Yeah. Because, and so that's the way the emu society works. Yeah. And so we look at the poor old man, he, you know, that, that's not a female walking around with all those kids. You can't eat him, do you? No, you're not, you're not allowed to blame him. No, no, true. You know. So we get payback that way, you know. Yeah. Yeah, we get the fat emu, that's the mother one. Yeah. Um, but, but these things are dictated to by what's up there. Now, I, I've, I've often been asked um, to write and the laws that govern our societies. And, um, and so when, you, when, you, when I looked at it, I sort of looked at that Bible, I looked at the Quran, and, and I'm thinking, okay, um, no, nah, you can't write anything like that. You know, that's stupid. <laughs> um, and you've got to look at some wonder way of telling these stories, you know. And I don't mean to insult any religious people in the audience, but, um, but it makes no sense to us because that's a very, very well defined and way of controlling the mind of people. But with us, we, we have a different way. And, and so I've been talking with people about um, how we sort of engage with the stars on the earth to say how, how that system controls our whole society and everything that we do. And so it's, it's, it's part of what they call the celestial law. It's a celestial teaching that we have. And the celestial law comes from the creators, comes from the origins. And in that creation we're taught about our relationship to everything that lives on this earth everything that's within our society. Like, when I talk about in the earth, I'm talking about around Gaduga and Walgut and Brewarana. Yeah, so that's my landscape. And I, but I, having gone through the ceremonies and learning the deep knowledge um, that's there, um, you really can't put that in a book. There's no way in the world you could put that in a book. Yeah, and, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a knowledge that's transferred by way of song, by way of dance. And of course, the white fellows learned very quickly because they learned from the Romans, the British learned from the Romans. Yeah. And the first thing you attack are the people's religious beliefs. That's the first thing you attack. Yeah. Back in those days, we didn't have towers, communication. Yeah. So you didn't target your communication towers. But you communicate, you, you attack the way the people transmitted their knowledge. And they, in my country, uh, the first thing they went after was the, the dendro juice. Because the, we didn't have rocks out on there, we have got flat country, but we've got plenty of trees. And so we carved the trees. And the, and the trees actually tell you the story, the beliefs. And you read all those, read, you learn to read those trees, those dendro juice. So it's a little bit like reading, you know, the hieroglyphs of, um, in Egypt, yeah. Only this knowledge is thousands of years older than that. And then when you, when you get into rocky country, stony country, um, that's when you see etchings on the rock. And those etchings, yeah. they will tell you those etchings and they will relate them to a place up there. Mm. Yeah, always relate that. And it's the same with, our, with the, with the dendroglyphs. We will always tell you the story, tell the story to the juvenile who's coming through, the uh, novices who's coming through the ceremony. We'll tell them 
So as they get to a certain age or a certain time or a certain experience in the ceremony, we will then pass that knowledge on to them and we'll take it to them. So these hieroglyphs and, and petroglyphs and, and the etchings on the rocks and the paintings on the, on the cave walls, that's our library. That is our library. Yeah, it's like, so you, 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 when you see these things being destroyed, it really hurts a lot of us because we know that that is our library. And our library and our authority work and, um, is being destroyed, it's being defaced. And it's very difficult to bring them back. Um, I recall when I was working with the National Aboriginal Conference as the um, Director of Treaty Research in, 80, 80, uh, in the 80s, um, from 81. We, we, we negotiated with Malcolm Fraser um, looking at this, my job was to develop a, um, you know, a strategy and a framework for a national treaty with the Commonwealth and the Aborigines. But inside of that, we also said, we, the people in the consultations we had were talking about what they wanted, their priorities. One of which was, we needed to get our sacred objects back from those museums. Because these white fellows, they've got these things in their museums, and they have no bloody idea what they're looking at. Okay? They have no idea what they mean. They have no idea of the significance. They have no idea of the relationship that those things have, not just to the people, the land and the sky. And so we facilitated an arrangement, um, one in particular, we flew a group of elders from Central Australia, old man that I'd been involved with, um, we flew them to Leipzig in Germany. And so we got to Germany and Strelau sent a lot of stuff out of Central Australia to Leipzig. And so when we got there, they opened the museum up and took us down into basements and, um, and so we got down there and there was one young fellow with them. He was going through the ceremony. And so he got, they got down there and they said to the Germans, thank you, see you later. And they said, what does that mean? I said, you have to go. Yeah. They said, so they had all these jewels, all the sacred objects sitting there that's never been seen for over 70 to 80 years by the people. And so all of a sudden, then we went upstairs, and then you could hear all the singing and the chanting, right? And so I said, okay, let's get out of here because this is not good for you fellows, okay? So I took them outside and I said, they said, oh, we, are we able to record that singing? And I thought to myself, nah, you know, how stupid. But anyway, I, 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 I you know, I, I just said, that I excused it because, of, you know, it's just pure ignorance, that's all. Isn't it? What can you say? So anyway, I said, come on, let's go and have a cup of tea. Yeah. And they said, how long? I said, oh, probably half the night. And it was actually all night. <laughs> so they sat there all night, the old fellows. And then they came out the next day. We took, we, everyone went to breakfast. And they wanted to take them back to the motels. Uh, they wanted to take them back to the motels and, and sit them down and, and have a chat with them um, about it and let them have a sleep. The old fellow said, no, 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 we're not, we're not tired. And because they'd been singing all night. So we had a feed and we were sitting there and then they, and the boss of the museum came to the where we were at the motel, we were all in, in there having some something to eat. And he says, they forgot the objects. What do we do with them? Do we pack them up and put them in a box? And where do we send them to? And then, the young fellow who was with him, he said, no, no, you can keep them now. They mean nothing for us no more. And so, they, and this was very confusing. And they said, no, 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 what are we going to do now? I, when they sang, we sang the song for this one. We sang that story from there. And we transferred the story by song and took the spirit from there onto a piece of paper, onto the drawing that I did of it. 
And so what we do now is we're going to take this home, so we wrap it up. You've got to go, not allowed to take that paper, you're not allowed to look at it. And so we take that home. And so when they go home, he said, what we do now is we get another one. And when we do that, we will sing that song from there back into that one country. And that's how we transport it home. You can't bring stuff that's from somewhere else, that's been handled by others and been corrupted. And, um, and so, they, so they transferred that. Now this is the same as what we have. You can't transfer the knowledge that we have about this place up here to anywhere else. You just can't. Yeah? We can talk about it in a book, but that's where it'll stay. Yeah? And then it becomes part of mind set of people and they learn the story. Um, but the, the stuff that I said earlier, there's much more to that story than what, you know, that, what, what you're reading. And so that, that's just the story of how we transfer knowledge and how we preserve that knowledge and, to, and move it around. And even when it's taken from us and we can find it, we go and we sing that song. And we sing that spirit out of there and back. And so this is what's important about transmission of knowledge for, for us more. And so that knowledge, it don't belong to us. That, that knowledge belongs to future generations. That's who that knowledge belongs to. We don't own it. Yeah. And, and so when you think of knowledge <coughs> belonging to future generations, then you, then you, of course, understand the importance of being very precise and being a carer and being a guardian of all of that that you learn. Because you're only here for a short time. You know, if you're here for a hundred years, you know, you're still a child in the scheme of time and space. Yeah. So if you die at 39, well, gee, you know, you're just born. You know, you've never really had a life at all. Um, and so when you look at time and space, from an Aboriginal perspective, time is never ending. Yeah. And when we, when we leave the earth, we, the old people always say, when we leave the earth here, yeah, we don't worry about time, there's no nine to five stuff. So. Yeah. And, and so time waits for no one, but you become part of time. And, and these are the things that we try and teach our children when we put them through ceremony and how we sort of compare those notes with what's up there and the stories that are there. Those stories will always be there. My only caution, having said that, is that the old people have a time. They, they, don't, they don't specify when this time is going to occur, but they say there is a time we have to prepare for when the universe tips up, back upside down, up again. And when the universe tips up, up again, well then all those planets will fall back on the bed, on the side of the bank of the river, that big worm roll up there, and they'll all fall back. You know, so, so we have a, um, yeah, a, a, a philosophy, we have a, a, um, a proposition that predicts that there will be a day when the universe will tip upside down again. Yeah. And I'm interested in what you said about somebody offering you a job to consider the apocalypse. Yeah? <laughs> and so someone's on the same wavelength as us. Yeah? And so it's, it's, it's interesting because um, we have to look at that um, from the ancient knowledge and have a look at all those, all those changes that are occurring. Um, like I, I, when people talk about Ice Age and talk about how old we are, you know, we, we can, I can take you in the Gomorrah country and show you where the last ice, um, last glacier melted and where it slid across the rocks and the, all the rocks and everything is still there, you know. So the tracks of time are wrenched into, our, into the earth. Marvel. And we need to make sure that we keep that knowledge going, but we must relate that to where the story originates from. And the story does not originate from Earth. It doesn't originate from the minds of man. We are too simple to understand any of that. Yeah. When I talk about science 
and understanding science. Well, then, you know, yeah. now that they're getting into astro astronomy with Aboriginal people, yeah, it, it, this is going to blow the education world apart because now it's opening up all these people with these magnificent minds and say, oh, shit, how does that all work? Okay, I'm going to do a PhD on that and find out about it. You know? But it's crazy because all you're doing is reading it from a book. Some, someone else and what do you think in your head? And then you've got to put all those little pieces together and make sense of it and sort of make someone understand that you think you know what you're talking about. Yeah. And when, you, when you're sitting with an old Murray fellow out in the bush, he's just going to tell you a story. Yeah. And then you as a scientist are going to go around and say, okay, what's the science behind that? Yeah. <laughs> and then you end up with PhD writers. Read the PhD writers. Yes, it's good reading all that stuff. Yeah. But how do you make that practical? How does that become working? How does that help you as an individual understand much more about your relationship to nature? In the field? And how does, that how does that teach you to be connected to the universe? How does that create an opportunity for you um, to delve into how this world works? And, and so there's so much um, that, that expands from, you know, from it. And it's interesting, and I, I, I finally got interested in Bob Fuller's sort of coming to me all the time, sort of got over being pissed off and all that jazz. But I, I finally worked out that, you know, this fellow's right, because he's now giving me an opportunity to give to white people and tell the white people of our real origins, where we come from. Yeah. And that's up there. That's up there. Yeah. And so everything we know here, so if you're doing all this astronomy up here, well then start getting all the scientists to look at all that stuff. And I'm, I was reading out there on your book, on your thing about there, about all those little particles of matter that's up there in the earth. You know. We just say, and that's all dust left over from the great, from an alpha punch the universe. Because he got wired with all them fellows up there, and because they were all mucking up, and so he punched the universe, and it tipped upside down. Yeah, you get angry, and everything's floating around. So when we look up there, they say, "Oh, look at all that dust still up there." You know, so it, nothing's settled yet. So this is millions of years old, but we've got Aboriginal people, elders sitting down there talking about, "Yeah, look at that. That's all that dust up there. And that poor old woman who live over there. Look at all that dust around." And we're talking about Magellan. Yeah? And so we're talking about all that dust not settling yet. And we're talking about all that water in the sky that hasn't settled anywhere. It's still floating. The water's still there. And so there's a lot of that stuff that we need to understand and pass on that knowledge to people. And uh, Dwayne has taken over and, and he's educating people through books. And it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to uh, to be able to pass on that knowledge, and you know, it's a medium that um, the general public know how to sort of get into understanding um, information. Thanks, Uncle. It's a starting point. Got to start yeah. someplace, right? I feel deeply honored and privileged to be here, and that we all have the opportunity to come learn tonight and to listen. So, um, without further ado, just want to mention that. The book is out. It's a starting point for all of this. 100% of all the author royalties of the book go to charity, and the charities depend on whether they're in Australia. They go to charity we set up here for First Nations scholarships and programs. All royalties of book sales in Aotearoa, New Zealand, go to the Society for Maori Astronomy and Research Traditions, Maori Astronomy, Research, and Traditions, uh, chaired by Pauline Harris, who's the first Maori astrophysicist with a PhD. And anything else overseas goes to Native Sky Watchers, which is a charity run by, or founded and directed by Dr. Annette Lee, who's a friend, colleague, and Lakota astrophysicist. So grab a book, and um, we'll see you outside. Thank you. Thank you.